surrender and so what surrender means and why it matters to us is it it's fine am i audible behind okay thank you so let's begin with some prayers om agyan timirandhasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे वाचाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो आल स्पीक ऑन द concluding words of the bhagavad gita which the great uh, acharya ramanuja says is the charam shloka the crest jewel verse of the bhagavad gita that is 1866 sarva dharman parityajya mame kam sharanam raja aham tvam sarva papebhyo moksha ishami ma shuchaha so here krishna is telling surrender to me forget everything else just surrender to me i'll take care of everything i will protect you so recently i was a part of a workshop given by multiple speakers it was directed toward people who are not very familiar with krishna consciousness with bhakti wisdom in general and primarily from a non indian background so the speaker before me had spoken out surrender to god and when i started we had some question answer session so the first question that came up one person asked he says Uh, why do i have to surrender to god i didn't even know that i was fighting with god <laughs> so <laughs> the idea was that the word surrender often has a martial connotation and when do you surrender you are fighting with someone and you can't win then you raise the white flag of surrender so that is that may be martial surrender in the battlefield context but what the bhagavad gita is talking about is devotional surrender and devotional surrender and martial surrender they are different in both their cause and their consequence in terms of cause when there is martial surrender it is because one realizes the opposite side is too powerful i can't win mm-hmm. that's the cause and in terms of consequence it's not at all a pleasant prospect no we don't know if we are surrendering to the opponent how they are going to treat us maybe after surrendering they may persecute us they may slaughter us they may torment us the fate of the surrendered is not very pleasant however neither of these two apply to devotional surrender in devotional surrender the cause is not frustration or helplessness the cause is affection the cause is love just like when two people are in love they may said you know your wish is my command what does that mean that i want to please you therefore i'll put aside my plans and do what you want me to do so that surrender is an expression of affection of love it is not forced it is voluntary so in terms of cause the devotional surrender that krishna is talking about is out of love and voluntary and in terms of consequence the gita describes and that's the whole message of the gita that actually god is our greatest well wisher he wants the best for us more than what we ourselves may want and therefore when we harmonize with the divine will then that that takes us to the best possible future so both in terms of cause and consequence devotional surrender 
is very different from martial surrender so in the bhagavad gita the theme of surrender comes on many occasions but primarily three so i'll talk about those three occasions and this 1866 verse which i came to i'll come to it at the end we look at these three senses in which the gita uses the word surrender and how that can be relevant for us so the in the start of the gita there is surrender arjuna speaks in 2.7 says karpanya dosho pahata swabhava pruchami tvam dharma sammudha chetah ye shreyasya nishchitam bruhi tanme shishyaste ham shadi mam tvam prapannam so prapannam is surrender so here krishna is surrendering to arjuna sorry arjuna is surrendering to krishna Hmm? now what is the context or what does surrender mean over here see arjuna is confused about the right thing to do hmm? arjuna is struck afflicted by a, by a agonizing ethical conflict so imagine somebody is a is a well established police person and a reputed police officer and a very fair where they punish the criminals and always let the uh, always let the innocent go unharmed and stay kept protected and now somebody has robbed a house robbed a make a big robbery and they fleeing and then the police is chasing that person and as the police come closer and closer and closer and then that person slips and falls now police can shoot this this is such a terrible criminal that the government has given shooter side orders hmm? so now they can just shoot and at that time this criminal turns around and they say this police person sees that that criminal is their own son now what do you do at such a time no should he act as a police person and shoot or should he act as a father and protect so there are two roles and there are two duties and they go in opposite directions similar was arjuna's tension at the start of the bhagavad gita he was a martial guardian society he was like a police person and he had to punish aggressors but those aggressors were his relatives among those aggressors were his venerable elders like his teacher and his grandfather so he has the bow and arrow he has raised it he is ready to fight but he confronts the reality that these are the people who are to fight against what am i to do now so at that time arjuna turns to krishna and he asks pruchami tvam dharma sammudha chetah i want to know what is dharma here dharma means the right thing to do what is the right thing for me to do and with and he says in asking this question before that in the first chapter second half as well as the second chapter the half the section before this arjuna has been giving his own ideas this is the right thing maybe not fighting is the right thing i should not fight i should not be greedy many reasons he is giving but at the end he is confused and then he says i surrender to you prapannam so here in 2.7 surrender is the means to gain knowledge amid confusion so surrender has different meanings at different times so in the bhagavad gita itself here it is sur- as a surrender is the means to gain knowledge amid confusion and we all will face situations where we just don't know what to do mm-hmm. should i do this should i do this right. yeah. there are many definitions of intelligence and one of the definitions is paradoxical is, intelligence means to know what to do when you don't know what to do <laughs> now you may say how is that possible if i don't know what to do how do i know no it is like okay if i don't know what to do whom to turn to or where to turn to to know what to do that is also intelligence like some people when they are driving 
driving is a functional activity but for some people it's like a activity of ego so if they are on the wrong path they will not admit they are on the wrong path they don't know the directions they will not admit it they say let's ask someone we will be lost no we are not lost i'm on the right track and getting further and further away from the destination no no i'll find the way so no at that time intelligence means okay i don't know what to do where to go so if i don't know what what where to go then what should i do i should ask someone who knows nowadays of course we have google maps but otherwise we ask some people over nearby if you are in an area where google maps or other gps systems don't cover you have to ask someone now it also requires intelligence to know whom to ask that's why it is intelligence it's intelligence is to know what to do when we don't know what to do and that willingness to turn towards someone who is more informed or wiser than us or at least more expert in that particular area that willingness is itself an expression of surrender generally when we talk about intelligence in today's world much of often intelligence is just reduced to iq is information processing ability how fast and how accurately can one solve math problems or do something some um, analytical questions that's fine that's one aspect of intelligence but the bhagavad gita defines intelligence not so much as information processing capacity as decision making capacity in the 18th chapter when krishna talks about verses 30 to 32 about buddhi he says buddhi is about making judicious decisions so when one doesn't know what to do the arjuna exemplifies what to do that is turn toward the divine in prayer and submission so turn so now we may say that for arjuna krishna was right next to him so i don't have krishna next to me so it's interesting that although krishna was right next to arjuna krishna did not give a pat answer to arjuna krishna led arjuna through a process of philosophical and moral deliberation by which arjuna himself could understand the right course of action so krishna did not simply give an answer if that's what krishna wanted to do he could have finished the bhagavad gita in six words i am god obey me fight gita over he doesn't do that because krishna is not just addressing the circumstantial over there krishna is addressing the eternal so he in the bhagavad gita provides the framework or template for a process of philosophical and moral reasoning by which we can arrive at a proper understanding however that process begins with prayerful submission so when we don't know what to do we all have many decisions to make you know should i pursue this career or that career should i take up uh, t- stay in this city or that city should i be in this relationship or not in this relationship so many decisions we have to take in life and the nature of the human condition is that frequently we have to take huge decisions based on tiny information when say we want to pursue a career well how much can we know about that career beforehand well we know some things we should try to know as much as we can but we don't know everything and we can't know one car- one particular career may be flourishing at a particular time but maybe we decide to pursue it 6 years 10 years down the line things may change in the industry in the market so how much can we know so if we decide to pursue a relationship with someone now how- we can try to know as much as possible about other other person but how much can we know actually in fact what to speak of we knowing the other person but that other person knows themselves also is a question isn't it we ourselves behave in ways that we say oh i couldn't have done that so we are charles dickens said that every person is a mystery to themselves and what to speak of to someone else so we can't know but we have to take decisions so what can we do is we can turn towards the divine in prayer and submission that does not mean that we outsource the responsibility for decision making to god and then wait for some mystical signal that's not the mood of the bhagavad gita 
But what he says is, when we turn in prayer and submission, then we open our heart to divine guidance. We, when we let our intelligence be guided by God. So then, when we pray and deliberate, and then strive to make a decision, we'll find that we will be better guided. We'll be able to think more clearly. We'll be able to understand. So, practically also, surrender could mean we connect with those who are spiritually wiser than us. They, they can act as the representatives of the divine and they can guide us. But this is the first mode of surrender. Uh, first, not mode, the first way surrender is depicted in the Bhagavad Gita. That when we don't know what to do, we know what to do. Turn to the divine in prayer and then use our intelligence to, uh, to arrive at a wise decision. So that is the first case where surrender occurs. The second, now I said there are many places, there are hints of surrender, but I am focusing on three, because these three are distinctive. The second is in another well-known verse of the Bhagavad Gita, 7.14. 7.14 is, gunamai mamamaya duratyaya mamevaye prapadyante mayametam tarantite says that divine indeed is this illusory energy it is almost impossible to overcome. But those who surrender to me, they can cross beyond this illusion. So currently, I, I mean, I'm speaking to her of America. So about four years ago, before the pandemic, when I had come, I was in a city and I, I, had, a lecture, I had a talk in one university. So, well, uh, so I did not know about Vitar University beforehand. So while I was going along, I asked, which university is this? Says, this is the... American Institute of Illusion. So, <laughs> it's a little taken aback, you know, it's an institute of illusion. So, the idea is that actually to make good illusion requires ability. So many movies are made, but most movies don't do very well. Why? Because the illusion is not very engaging and people get bored. So, to even make good illusion Good illusion, that means that will engage us, that will absorb us. That requires intelligence, that requires ability. So, Krishna says that the illusions that are there in this world, that sometimes delude us, that sometimes captivate us, they are not ordinary. That this illusory energy, Maya, is my energy. So she is manifesting God's intelligence. And that is why it is very difficult to overcome the illusions that come up in our life. So, what happens with respect to illusion is that we all have some illusions that we share and there are some illusions that we are particularly vulnerable to individually. Hmm? Sometimes people ask, I was in Australia when I was asked this question that you know, if God wants us to do the good thing, the right thing, then why are there so many bad options? In fact, why are there more bad options than good options? So I said, that's how it always is in every multiple choice exam. Isn't it? <laughs> Normally four wrong options and only one right option. So the student in today's world may sue the teacher. He may say, you know, four wrong answers you gave, so 80% probability that I'll get it wrong. And you expect that I should get 40% to pass. Therefore, you have rigged the system for me to fail. Therefore, I will hold you responsible for my failure. Will that work? No. Because the choosing is not based on probability. The choosing is based on intelligence. Choosing is based on one study. So, yes, there may be four wrong options, but the test of the student is to be able to have studied sufficiently so that they can choose the right option. In terms of number, yes, the wrong options are more. But that doesn't rig the system against the student. So similarly, in the world, there are many options. In fact, the world broadly serves two purposes. One is experimentation and the other is redirection. We all want to be happy. And actually we are made in such a way that we can be happiest when 
we connect with the divine in love. In fact, love is the purpose of existence. But not just the love that is talked about in romance novels and romantic movies. It is, this is love that is enduring. That is love that is eternal. This is love that is uplifting. That is love between humanity and divinity. And then, for that foundational love, love for each other. So that can give our heart the greatest fulfillment. But unfortunately, uh, we have our own conceptions of what will make us happy. And because of that, we try, maybe I'll try this, maybe I'll try that, maybe I'll try that. And we keep trying hundreds and hundreds of things. And so the world is a place where we can do experimentation. See, God does not want to force us. Say if a boy proposes to a girl, please marry me. And she says no. And he takes out a gun. If you don't marry me, I'll shoot you. Well, that won't be love. That will be force. So, God does not want to force us. That's why he gives us free will. And not only gives us free will, there is a world in which we can exercise that free will. And do what we think will make us happy. So the multiple options that are there, they are for us to try out our ideas of what will make us happy. And when we realize, yeah, some things make me happy, but it's not, it doesn't last for very long. It just, see many of the things that promise us happiness, they are such that, that as long as we don't have them, we, we feel extremely discontented. So money is something we all need for living. But for most people, money is not just something which they want for a living. For people, money becomes their whole, not just the means of living, but the purpose of living. So m money is not just indicative of their net worth. Money becomes indicative of their self-worth. And then what happens? That the nature of money is that when we don't have it, we want it. And when we have it, we want it more. And it just leads to insatiable craving. It's like, and the same applies to sensual, the same applies to sensual pleasure. When physical, physical enjoyment through the senses people are seeking, there's some sociologists, nowadays people do surveys of everything. So, most people when they're engaging in sensual pleasure, most people they find they're bored. It's before that there is craving, but during the moment, it's like, okay, it's over, oh, it's anticlimax. So most of the things we think will make us happy, they don't really make us happy. They give a little pleasure, but it, it disappears after some time. That's the law of diminishing returns. So suppose uh, there is food after this program. Well, don't suppose food is there, <laughs> but suppose there is a unlimited desserts. Say maybe there is some dessert like gulab jamun. Hmm? So now what happens is, if we hear this gulab, I want it. It's delicious. So we take one. Oh, wonderful. Can I have one more? Two. Yes. Three. Four. Now, suppose we have ten. We'll say, enough. No, please take more. No, no, I don't want more. Now you take more. And then after the same thing, the first gulab jamun was irresistible. But if we take, if the twentieth gulab jamun is offered to us, the same thing which is irresistible will become unbearable. I feel like I'm going to throw up now. So, so is the pleasure in that object? If it were in that object, why does the twentieth iteration of that object not give us the same pleasure as the first? So it's yeah, it's not that the pleasure is not there in that object. It is not only in that object. It is in our imagination that surrounds that object. And to the extent that imagination gets depleted, to that extent the pleasure also gets depleted. So the imagination gets dissipated. The imagination gets dissipated by collision with the hard rock of reality. Then the pleasure also disappears. So we have many things which you can seek for pleasure. But it is when we turn towards the Lord in devotion and then use all our talents and abilities in his service, we get the highest fulfillment. So, so this illusion overcoming that, we, may, we all have this understanding that okay, certain things are good, certain things are bad. But we are unable to give it up. Hmm? So, uh, it's like, there was one, one singer, pop singer, he says, you know, like, you treat me badly, I love you madly. 
you treat me badly i love you madly you know that is the case for all of us probably we can say this with respect to addicts you know they get into so much trouble because of the object of addiction and yet they crave for it madly but to a lesser degree all our attachments are like that you know we get into trouble because of our attachments they because of them we we suffer but still we love them madly because that illusion doesn't go away that illusion just stays and you may say we may somebody may drink a lot and they get a hangover and it's such a splitting headache and such a noxious no, nauseous feeling i'm never going to drink again and within a few days the next party is there when are the drinks coming so what happens is the illusion stays on so krishna says the way out of the illusions that are bedeviling us is by surrender so first was more you could say ignorance about the right thing to do the second is illusion in terms of the inability to do the right thing there's a difference here i know what is the right thing but just when the temptation comes i just completely forget i just can't resist it seems like a f2 button is pressed in our memory delete and then whatever resolutions are there they're all evaporated so to overcome that is surrender now what does surrender mean in this context here surrender basically means that we hold on to god through the process of bhakti through the practice of bhakti first surrender was openness to guidance but here surrender is like holding on if we are in a way if in a ocean and waves are coming the waves are giant they will buffet us they will knock us away we can't fight against the waves ourselves but if we have an anchor that we can hold on to then by that the strength of hold that anchor we will avoid getting swept away so we can't fight against illusion by focusing on how it is an illusion it it won't work if somebody says i'll sit and look at temptation and deconstruct it well no it will deconstruct our determination it won't work we have to direct our focus towards something higher towards something fulfilling so the practice of bhakti yoga enables us to focus our consciousness on god so when we chant the holy names when we hear spiritual wisdom when we pray and worship the deities when we come in sacred holy association by all this we are holding on to the anchor that is god and then whatever illusions may come whatever may divert us from our path those illusions will be able to overcome it's amazing uh, people all over the world have experienced there some habits they're struggling to give up some unhealthy habits and they couldn't and they started practicing bhakti and it's almost like magic those habits just seem to lose their hold lose their grip of course some habits take more time than others but the transformation happens so surrender is for protecting ourselves or freeing ourselves from illusion so don't fight with the illusion fight to hold on to god and god will fight with the illusions if we try to fight with our illusions ourselves they are too strong they will overpower us so that is the second mode of surrender the third mode this i'll conclude and we'll have few questions this is what krishna talks at the end he says give up all ideas sarva dharman parityajya maham ekam sharanam vracha now this literally this verse can be very confusing <coughs> why because dharma can mean many things so i was in india at a gita recitation uh, program they had asked me to give prizes over there and they were uh, this was a general hindu festival so they reciting and when the kids were reciting this verse they said that the sarias sarva adharman parityajya mame kam sharanam vraja so then i asked the organizers this verse is sarva dharman parityajya why sarva adharman parityajya so he said is actually it doesn't make any sense god has come to establish dharma god has come to establish virtue why will he tell everyone to will he tell tell us to give up virtue he said say that abhi thought that actually when the gita was written down there was originally an a but that a was forgotten by some transcriber so we are putting back that a so what of this is foolishness actually for arjuna there was no question of adharma he was a very virtuous person so it's uh, he doesn't have to be told to give up all adharma 
it's like a person who is extremely honest you tell them you know you should not murder and murder people said, what you know what are you talking about so that doesn't make any sense but sarva dharman parityaja what it means over here is that you have your conceptions of what is the right thing to do hmm? just put aside your conceptions mam ekam sharanam raja just do my will so here surrender means doing god's will and that is what this is 1866 seven verses later arjuna speaks and arjuna speaks his conclusion his understanding of the gita and what does he say over there nashto moha smriti labdha tvat prasadan maya achyuta sthito asmi gata sandeha karishye vachanam tava karishye vachanam tava i will do your will so here surrender means doing god's will so the three incremental senses first was turning to god for guidance what should i do then turning to god for strength when i know what is the right thing to do but i am unable to do it and now it is not just we do the right thing but we do god's will so now why should we do god's will or what does doing god's will mean actually so in one sense here surrender is the way to fulfilling the highest human potential see god is not like some arbitrary person like a taskmaster who will just tell us to do whatever they need us to do now god is our greatest well wisher so imagine if a parent gives a gives their child a like expensive computer and then now the parents also know this child has some interests this kid has some interest in computer programming and computer like that and then the child neglects the computer and asks the parents what can i do to please you what can i do to please you what i have given you use it use it use it for doing good work so similarly god's pleasure doing god's will what does it mean it means using the gifts that god has given us for serving humanity for serving god for doing good in the world each one of us has gifts but unfortunately we devalue the gifts that we have why because we look at all the gifts we don't have you know oh, this person is smarter than me this person is fairer than me this person is taller than me this person is thinner than me slimmer than me we look at all the things and we feel dissatisfied it's like suppose after this and uh, after this program we are going to have a food suppose it's a special menu where everybody has a different uh, dessert somebody has gulab jamun somebody has sundae somebody has malpoa somebody has um, uh, chocolate cookies somebody has various things like that now we have a delicacy in our plate but we are looking what does this person have what does that person have and what does that person have and even if we eat what we have it won't taste good <laughs> it is good it is tasty but you won't taste it why because we are distracted we're looking at everyone what everyone else has and that will keep us discontented so here surrender sometimes like i started by saying surrender means oh i just surrender it's just i quit well that's not the exact meaning of surrender in the gita surrender means i will do your will so surrender in this context means that to do what we can with what we have now so to do what we can with what we have now in a mood of service in a mood of devotion so we don't have to compare now others may have far better abilities than they have than what we have somebody may have more wealth than we have somebody may have better looks than what we have somebody may have sharper brains than what we have but none of those things in themselves will make them happy will give them fulfillment somebody may have a lot of wealth but their happiness will depend not on how much wealth they have but on how well they are using that wealth otherwise by misusing their wealth they will create suffering for themselves they will get into unhealthy habits unhealthy behaviors so they won't be happy so similarly for each one of us what we have is not necessarily what we need forever 
but what we have is what we need right now so accept it and use it and god will give us more surrender in that context means krishna tells arjuna don't resent the situation you are in now don't think why do you have to fight against your grand sire or against your teacher you have been given archery ability you have been given opportunity to serve humanity with your archery ability do that right now so later in the mahabharat krishna tells arjuna in a, in a, in a one of another difficult moments of arjuna's life that this difficulties and distresses come upon everyone in the world is upon the good people and the bad people among the among the wise people and the other wise people <laughs> so distresses come upon everyone but what differentiates the wise and the other wise is the other wise people in the midst of distress they act in ways that makes things worse whereas the wise people act in ways that makes things better so we may have some distress you know oh you know this person has more friends than what i have this person has more facebook followers than what i have you know that can be a big crisis of not just uh, it can be identity crisis for people nowadays you know i posted this and i got only 5 likes and he or she posted then they got 25 likes what is the use of my life <laughs> it can become like that but the point is that rather than worrying about this you know who has how much influence how much followers how much possessions we focus on okay that can be a source of distress for me but what can i do to make things better if i just crave for what they do, what they have or lament about what i don't have i am only making things worse but what i have i try to use it constructively use it in the mood of service and we'll find that therein we will gain contentment now if we just take the responsibility to use what we have in a mood of service we'll find our life becoming our life becoming filled with meaning and eventually filled with fulfillment now happiness does not depend on what we have it depends on how we use what we have it depends on how we take responsibility for using what we have and that is, so ultimately doing god's will it's not that god has to come in some mystical revelation and tell us this is what my will is yes there are certain things god wants us to connect with him in devotion so praying to him chanting his names understanding the wisdom that he has given us that is his will definitely but along with that his will is that whatever situation we find ourselves in we act to make things better we act in a way using whatever abilities we have to make things better shila prabhupad is an example of this shila prabhupad in one sense he was he was always a great enlightened soul so he would was not having ignorance or illusion but the third mode of surrender when he was in india nobody seemed to be interested in the spiritual knowledge of the bhagavad gita so what did he do i am going to do god's will so he decided to come to america and he composed a song while he was coming to america and what in that song he says my dear lord i don't know what why you brought me here aniya chukina why have you brought me here not know but you must have some purpose so na chao na chao prabhu na chao se mate kashthera putali jata na chao se mate my dear lord make me dance make me dance as a puppet master makes a puppet dance make me dance now this is not giving up of one's independence or intelligence prabhupad was using his intelligence okay here here we can share bhakti more effectively here people not interested this is an opportunity prabhupad was using all the intelligence he had and he was not thinking oh so many people are materialistic this is a materialistic age people are not interested no who is interested what can i do to make things better and if we try to act in that mood if we try to make a positive difference no one knows how much of a positive difference we can make god can empower each one of us to do far more than what we think we are capable of in fact discovering how much of a positive difference we can make that can be our life's greatest adventure and surrender 
in the sense of that willingness to act in harmony with the divine will to use the gifts that the divine has given us that surrender is the is the opening of the door to life's greatest adventure and that is what is signified in the end of the bhagavad gita where the gita says wherever there is krishna and arjuna that means wherever there is divinity and humanity united together there there will be prosperity there will be success there will be morality there will be fulfillment so this is how the gita is a guide book for life helping us to overcome ignorance to overcome illusion and to maximize our human potential and our contribution in the world thereof as quickly summarize i spoke broadly on the topic of surrender today so we talked about martial surrender and devotional surrender are different in terms of their cause it's not helplessness or frustration but it's a love and the expression of love and the consequence is not uh, unpleasant fate but a intimate bond of love with the divine the first occurrence of surrender is in when we, when arjuna doesn't know what is the right thing to do in the face of ethical crisis and he turns to krishna for guidance so this surrender opens us up to the definition of intelligence as to know what to do when we don't know what to do krishna doesn't give pat answers to arjuna but guides him through a process of moral reasoning so like that when we f- we, f- we are faced with indecision we can pray to the divine and then with that divine light illumining our guidance our intelligence we can move toward judicious decisions the second definition is up to 2.7 7.14 that surrender enables us to overcome illusion that even when we know what is the right thing to do sometimes we get captivated by illusions the world is meant for experimentation and redirection so if we have our own ideas of what will make us happy the world gives us forum for that however <laughs> if we want to turn toward the divine we have that opportunity also so rather than fighting against the illusions that be developers we focus on connecting with the lord and he will fight against the illusions he will help us overcome our unhealthy hang ups or whatever it is that deludes us and the last was surrender means to do the will of the divine and god's will is what that is like a parent has given anything something valuable to the children want to, children to use it fully so god has given each one of us gifts so instead of looking at what gifts we don't have we focus on what we have and use them in a mood of service instead of feeling distressed because of our situations or comparison with others we think what can i do to make things better and if we act in this mood of service you know who knows how much of a positive difference we can make discovering that how much positive difference we can make can be our life's greatest adventure the gita is a call to each one of us to join in this ultimate adventure thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions yes please Hare Krishna thank you very much for the lecture i appreciate the lecture also all the teachings that you have online uh you touched a topic of changing habit or habit control in your in your talk today that with practicing bhakti habits of people are changing as if it's like a magic um do we have any documentation or measurement that could uh support that claim and uh that would be the kind of like the first part of the question and the second part of if there is no such thing is there uh is there a determination of having such uh measurement thank you yeah so if you say that bhakti practice can change habits is there any scientific study done to validate this well yes and no yes in the sense that there are several devotees who in sociology for example from florida university dr david brand will the study of regular mantra chanting and its associates 
effect on one's mental states. So depression and negativity, they had a parameter for measuring that. That significantly went down. And as our movement is expanding, you know, it's attracting more attention. So I think more studies will be done. But beyond sociological studies like that, uh, devotees follow certain principles. So we, as spiritual practitioners, we avoid certain indulgences. And so we avoid, avoid meat, we avoid intoxication, we avoid gambling, we avoid unrestrained sexual activity. Nobody is forcing us to do that. The whole world is filled with temptations. And still, you'll see people living in this world and voluntarily being able to avoid them to a substantial degree. So what is making it possible? Many of the people who started practicing this, they were... Uh, now, I'm not getting into the moral value of what is right and what is wrong. I'm simply talking about behavior over here. That many people were eating meat and they stopped eating meat. And it is not that it was a big struggle. It changed effortlessly. The people who were... Uh, the very fact that these four principles are being followed and not it's like a constant torment. Uh, it, it is being followed. So that, that itself would be a demonstration. For some people may say, oh, these rules are so strict and all of these people are inhibited. They walk. But no, no, it's not inhibition because every individual is free. Anybody can just leave Krishna Bhakti if they want and start indulging in whatever pleasures they want to. Nobody is keeping anyone by force over here. The fact that somebody is voluntarily doing it indicates that they're experiencing something higher in life because of which these, uh, these uh, particular the pull of these particular pleasures is no longer that strong. Okay? So but definitely further studies can and should be done. And I think as our movement expands, in terms of the history of religion, Krishna consciousness and Bhakti Yoga have been practiced for millennia in India. But in terms of their interface with modern, with, with modern or postmodern Western, Western culture and Western interface, the Krishna consciousness movement started about about 50, 55 years ago. So, we are growing and definitely such studies will be done in the future. Okay. Yes, please. One sec. One sec. So, Prabhuji, we already have proof. We already have statistics because when Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada came to US, his first disciples were hippies who were taking LSD. And it was, they, have, they were womanizers, they were intoxicated most of the time. And those people, because of chanting and because of bhakti, they changed. So that mm -hmm. proof is already there, I think. That, yeah, that is bhakti, is, bhakti is what really helped them get out of all their intoxications and addictions. Yes. So I just wanted to add. Thank you. That's a good point. That's definitely true. I just didn't mention it that because one. that's not been, so you could say empirical, so, so, sociology itself was not developed at that time so yeah. much. So that's why it's not empirically documented in sociological studies. But it's a well-known fact. If we talk with the first-person testimony of people, then definitely we'll see that. Yes, please. Actually, I can give a first-person testimony for that. So, um, at one point in my life, I was on psychiatric medication for like mood stabilization. Uh, but then I started hearing about Krishna and I started hearing, you know, how they say you should hear about him. I started hearing about him, listening to his bhajans, reading about him. And uh, I completely went off medication, never needed it again. So it really works. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you for sharing that. Wonderful. Yes. Close. Speak close. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you so much for your class. Um, I just, sorry, one minute. I would just yes. add one thing. So we are not saying that you chant Hare Krishna and stop taking medication. That is not the point over here. In some cases, sometimes clinical depression may require medication. But what happens is some people think you can't solve mental health problems just by popping pills. There is a multifaceted approach. And sometimes when one finds higher meaning, higher fulfillment, then the pharmacologic, pharmacological dependence may dissipate completely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you so much for your class. Um, so I, you had made a very, very interest, very useful point actually, where you said, "What can, uh, especially when you're tempted with illusion, you can ask this question: What can I do to make things better?" So I've heard you many times, and I try to implement this, but I've noticed myself it's very difficult during the time I'm like super caught up with other things, and maybe a few hours after I start thinking, "Oh, I remember hearing this." So I'm curious: How do I 
potentially, um, I would say, keep remember it at that moment, or how, I mean, is it what's the strategy to actually remember at that point? Okay. So if we want to act in ways that make things better, but in the heat of the moment we tend to forget and we act impulsively. So how how can we remember that more promptly? Well, mm, the pathway to greater self-awareness is through self-awareness. What I mean by that is that at least it is good that later we realize, oh, I could have remembered at that time. Hmm? Like some people, they commit some terrible mistake. You know, they, they may, like, you know, somebody may hurt us grievously. And then we go through a lot of hard burn and finally we resolve. Now I'm going to forgive that other person. And then we go and say, I forgive you. And they ask, what did I do to deserve forgiveness? Hmm. So they don't even know they did something wrong. So that is a terrible level of, you could say, self-unawareness. So even if we, after doing something that, is, that we will not be proud of, later at least we realize that is also a level of self-awareness. So you could put it, another way to put it, even lack of awareness or lack of self-awareness is a level of self-awareness. Because some people lack self-awareness and they don't even know that they lack self-awareness. So they just do foolish things, they do terrible, th hurtful things and we go on with it. So don't feel discouraged. Okay, at least later I am realizing it. Now, what we could do is, sometimes we need external aids. So for example, if, you know, if there is some thought which you like, some words which you like, some point which you like, you know, maybe keep it on the notepad on your phone, keep it in a sticky note, or maybe read it every day sometime, read that thought. Especially the kind of obstacles that we face regularly, the kind of challenges which we face regularly, if we know those and we know what could help me to navigate this, then keep that accessible. Keep that accessible. So, it's like wisdom is valuable, but Say, if you consider wisdom is like a weapon for fighting against illusion. Mm -hmm. If a soldier is on the battlefield and suddenly the enemy attacks, soldier can't say, hey, wait, wait, let me go to my tent, get my weapon and then I'll fight with you. No. Uh, a we weapon in the tent is of no use to a soldier in the fight. So the soldier has to have the weapon with them. So similarly, we have to find out what is the way we can keep the wisdom with us, accessible to us. So one way is also speaking about it. And if you speak about something to others, say if the typical people with whom we tend to sometimes act in ways make the things work, we speak this, not in a didactic, holier than without it, but in the mood of sharing. Then when we are acting in an impulsive way, hey, this is not what I spoke. Maybe that will take us. So create support systems, for supports for ourselves. That will help quite a bit. Okay? Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi, um, I'm Pranav and uh, hi, uh, so thank you for your lecture, I really enjoyed it. So myself, I'm a PhD and I'm working at UCLA right now and today is my first day, I really enjoyed it. So I have a question regarding the fulfillment and contentment you were uh, talking about. So um, the pleasure or the contentment that a lot of us are seeking um, on a constant basis through our careers is through career growth. Okay, so my question is regarding career growth. How not to um, get yourself trapped in the pleasures that come through career growth? So for example, in, in your work, you always, uh, you always try to work harder and harder so that um, you get to a position which is better than you, right? That's true. And with that, it also like, to reward yourself, you always try to go uh, to get yourself a better house, a better car, or if you don't have a house, you try to get a house, and okay. then you try to upgrade it, right? If you don't have a car, you try to get a car, and then you try to get a coupe or a Tesla, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So how not to fall in that trap of, you know, needing more while being in karma yoga and try to work more and, you know, not falling in that trap? Okay, that's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you for asking it. So. How can we, we pursue growth, but we can get 
trapped in pursuing growth so how do we avoid that see growth is a part of the natural human condition each one of us was just one tiny cell in our mother's womb at one time now there are millions and millions billions of cells in our body how did this happen through growth so growth is natural growth is wonderful however cancer is also growth hmm? the difference is that cancer involves disproportionate and destructive growth it's disproportionate and that's why destructive one one tissue in the body starts growing so much that it starts damaging all other parts of the body so similarly for us we have different facets to our life when yudhish when narad muni comes to meet yudhishthir yudhishthir has just been enthroned as the king of indraprastha he says that there is dharma artha and kama so it is virtue profit and pleasure he says o king are you pursuing all these three in balance don't pursue virtue at the expense of profit and pleasure don't pursue profit at the expense of virtue and pleasure don't pursue pleasure at the expense of virtue and profit so we could say these three things broadly refer to three aspects of our life virtue is primarily connect, cultivated through our practice of spirituality or bhakti so that is temple and spiritual places like that so profit is cultivated through our job our profession our career and we could say in this context pleasure is cultivated through our family and our relationships so that's our so our the temple the workplace and the home all these three are important for us and uh, if we want to grow in a way that is sustainable all three should be growing if we focus only on one thing then what to speak of neglecting our spiritual side sometimes people become workaholics and they neglect even their relationships they become very successful but they just lonely because they have ruined the relationships so the, to avoid this being caught in this phenomena of growth or not in the phenomena in obsession with growth we can we can understand that growth has to be multifaceted that yes Yes, it's natural if we have a house to want a bigger house. We have car, we want to have bigger car. That's natural. So, when does ambition become greed? Ambition becomes greed. So, when it is at the cost of virtue. Artha becomes lobha when it is at the cost of dharma. Artha seeking artha is natural, but it becomes greed when we compromise virtue for that purpose. So yes it's not that we are meant to be spiritual we are meant to be lazy in all areas of life we are diligent we are resourceful we are active ambition is never the problem it is unidimensional ambition ambition reduced only to one area of life at the expense of everything else so that's why if we have well wishers around us guides around us whom we can turn to whom we trust then they can help us find the balance because we may become based on our particular conditions external conditions and even our internal conditionings we may tend to get imbalance in any one direction so uh, if so both by our own introspection and by the guidance of well wishers around us we can find the balance between these three okay thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna one quick one, one um the what law of oh Now, now I lost my um, diminishing returns. I read about that in the ninth grade, and I found that it applied to most things. But but I found that it didn't apply to chanting Hare Krishna or reading transcendental literatures because I've been doing that fifty two and a half years, and they both get met better. They didn't diminish. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. So Shri Mad Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Shri Prabhu Pad ki jai. Thank you. Uh, for